so nice to be here with you, Thomas, on the occasion of your 35th anniversary of honing your craft in photography, portraiture photography. Um, I'd love to talk with you about some of the reflections that you're making on the occasion of this anniversary and talk to you about where you've been and looking forward, where you anticipate you'll be five, ten years from now in continuing to hone your craft. Um, so the first thing, it's, it's well known that you received your first camera at the age of 10, an Instamatic X15, yes. if I'm correct. So why was that the right gift for you at that time? Uh, my uncle, when I was younger, I was probably seven or eight, he had gotten into photography and he had gotten a dark room. He showed me uh, prints coming out of the tray uh, and with uh, you know the safe lights, the yellow safe lights, and I was fascinated as a young child. And it was something that I had never seen before, and I just, well, it just you know, astounded me how cool that was. And so on my tenth birthday, my uncle Charlie gave me a Kodak X15, and that started me on a journey, and that led me to. Um, the time I was um, 12, I had such a photography habit that I ended up starting a lawn mowing business. Um, and by the time I was 12, I had earned $75 that I had saved, and I and I had bought my first darkroom for 75, bought it in larger and some trays and a developing tank. By the time I was 12, so that was um, amazing for me. And then I set up a little darkroom in my parents' basement, and I really just took off from there. That was. Um, an amazing point in my life. And then I started shooting, capturing moments. Um, I was just, the more I was shooting, the more fascinated I became. Um, and later I learned about Henry Cartier-Bresant and his, um, he defined the decisive moment and I realized that that's what I was doing. That was really uh, profound and um, to me that I was actually capturing moments. But then another uh, amazing thing happened and that is that I found a book by Josef Karsh in a bookstore and Josef was able to capture the essence of people through their eyes. And so I then um, was so amazed by his work that, that he was actually capturing a, a glimpse of the soul that I set out on a lifelong quest to capture the inside of people rather than just their external shell and that's kind of that that's kind of where it all began and continues um, 35 years later yeah absolutely so those were some significant influences in your life did your did your uncle continue to mentor you did you have other mentors um, I passed my way? uncle pretty quick yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I was the photographer for everything growing up, um, whatever club I was in or whatever, I was the official photographer. At what point did you, I know that you, after discovering Yosef Karsh, that you began really working on your study of eyes as a glimpse of the soul. Um, when did you start pursuing formal portraiture? From the time I was so young, my mom would, was so, you know, gracious and she would drive me to the camera shop and I spent a lot of time there and I um, eventually got a job there. The day I turned 16 they hired me as a stock boy for four dollars an hour and um, I had made up some business cards you know photography by Thomas Balsamo and when people would come into the camera store and they say do you know a portrait photographer I would say yeah and I'd hand them my card and that's literally how I got my first handful of clients was working at the, at the camera shop. Do you remember your actual first I, I do, I remember some clients, yeah I do, I have some, you know, some of my old clients, I still see some of them some of the time, once in a while, but um, that was amazing. My parents let me set up a studio in their basement, so I had a studio set up in the 70s, in the late 70s, and my parents had the orange shag carpet, and it was in then, and that was my first studio. Did the orange shag carpet contribute in a positive way to your photograph? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> <laughs> because I noticed you haven't selected that for your current studios. Right, yeah, no, I haven't. Yeah. Subdued tones. Got rid of that. Um, so tell me about your choice as you developed as an artist to remain in the area in which you were born 
and grew up and um, began to hone your craft? Well, um, it was kind of a natural for me to stay here because it, I had started building a clientele and I had built it up, you know, pretty quickly in the beginning, you know, it was, it was rough, but um, I put my heart and soul into my work and um, it started to catch on and I did, um, I had a stint where I had the privilege of working with Margarita Bauer and Charlie and Margarita had a, a black and white portrait business in Barrington and uh, when they quit working together then Margarita and I got together and so we worked together as a team for a little while and I learned a lot from Margarita she really um, you know set me straight you know she like pointed me in the direction and you know helped me to develop my price list and, and you know and uh, um, just kind of like she really um, gave me a lot so I'm very grateful and then you know we kind of drifted off but I kept on the quest that from the beginning it was about capturing the essence of people and that's all I really cared about and um, you know there was some milestones along the way um, and I, I just kept on um, putting my heart and soul into my work and it, all of a sudden I just started getting clients from all over even out of state and then eventually from other countries which was um, which has really been amazing and um, the you know the journey has been pretty incredible. There was you know one client from Madrid. In fact, they invited me to Madrid, but I was too busy to go, which I regret. But um, they said they had uh, someone come into their home in Madrid, and they have a whole gallery wall of my work. And these people that came to visit, they recognized my work. They said that's Thomas's work, and all the way in Madrid, people recognized my work, which was really. Cool. Absolutely. It's a wonderful, humbling moment, I bet. Yeah, that's exceptional. Um, and can you tell me a little bit about some of your long-standing relationships with clients in the area and how you've had the opportunity to watch them grow and change over time? Yeah, it's been a real privilege for me um, because I care about people and I, I been able to be such an important part of so fam so many families lives by documenting the process of their family growing up and there's been um, you know many many families where I photograph the kids as babies or very young children and I watched them grow and you know they would come back every year or two years or five years and and I got to see these kids grow up into adults and now they have their kids and they're bringing some of them in bring it, are bringing their kids in now and it's just profound um, and I've got like you know all these files um, you know documenting this process which you know is just amazing that's exceptional um, now your, your photography career spans a pretty significant technological shifts in terms of photography equipment moving from um, film to digital. Mm -hmm. How has that transformed the way that you do business? Film to digital, wow. <laughs> that was a tough, uh, that was a 10 year, you know, I mean I've been doing it 10 years now, but there was a tough transition for me. I love the dark room, I love the smell of the fixer, which I miss to this day. My, but, um, the digital shift was a challenge because in the beginning the equipment wasn't able to keep up with me and I was doing a, a lot of work with special needs kids and I had just um, got off doing the Souls book when I really got serious about digital and the first camera you know, I'd be capturing and then it would have a buffer and it would be full and I would have to wait and I would miss moments especially when you're working with autistic kids and they're busy and they're moving around and be like oh there's the shot I'm looking for and I could see it and I pushed the shutter and it didn't fire so in the beginning it was actually quite frustrating to me but eventually the equipment improved and and then now it's amazing I love the digital and the capabilities that it has there's something special about film and tray developing that will always be there it's kind of a special sacred uh, process but um, digital is amazing as well. So there's no more dark room? No more dark room, yeah. Digital. So let's do that. So let's go back a moment. Okay. Since what we're doing here is reflecting. Let's All right. go back to some of your earlier influences again and talk about 
Arnold Newman, um, with whom you had um, experiences in your 20s, correct? Um, actually, Arnold, the way that I learned really my craft of uh, portraiture is that um, I spent my youth when other kids were probably out. I would go to libraries and bookstores and I would spend like the day going down to Chicago to the Crocs Burntanos and I would, they had a whole floor of photography books and I would spend, I would go down there whenever I could and I would just look at all these images and all these portraits and I would find the photographers that had the work that moved me the most, the, the work that influenced me and caused me to experience an emotional response. Um, and my favorites were like, you know, Karsh, which I've mentioned, and uh, Arnold Newman, and Harry Callahan, and Patrick DeMerchler, uh, and I could keep on going. Um, but it's really amazing how certain photographers have, a, have developed a recognizable style, and you could look at their work and you just know it's theirs. And so in, in this process of years of just looking at images, and what I did was I look at these images and I would ask myself, you know, how does this image make me feel? And I realized that one of three things was happening. Anytime I looked at an image, either it was making me feel good, or it was making me feel bad, or, or I didn't feel anything at all. And I realized that really the thing that makes me, the images that make me feel nothing at all, is really designed to be kind of a physical record of something, and that it's not really art if it doesn't make me feel something. But then I realized that some images make me feel good and other ones make me feel bad. And then when you think about the value of an image, even if an image makes you feel bad, it's still valuable because it makes you feel something. Although I have chosen to create images that make me and others feel good when they experience it. So it's really all about an emotional response, you know, generated by the image to the viewer. And so in that process, I, I um, you know, I got a, an opportunity to really become familiar with Arnold Newman's work from New York, and he, his work was amazing, and, and he was um, um, just uh, able to capture kind of the essence of people in a way that, you know, and he did a lot of environmental work as well, that was his thing. And so anyway, I had looked at Arnold Newman's work for many, many years and I would have books all over my floor, even the bedroom floor when I lived at home with my parents. I would have books all over the floor in my room and I would have my work kind of scattered between it and, and I would, you know, and I was so unhappy with my work for many years and finally, you know, it got to the point where, you know, I finally started getting to the point where I liked my work, or I loved my work eventually, but Arnold Newman's work was right there. And um, a neat opportunity came to me um, probably about eight years ago or so, uh, or nine, I don't know how many years ago it was, but um, an opportunity came to me um, to spend some time with Arnold Newman. And he had done a, a a class in Maine where he wanted to spend, you know, like three days with ten photographers from around the world. And you had to get into this by sending a portfolio and artist statements and a whole bunch of things. And I was fortunate enough to get to spend time with Arnold Newman, so I spent three days with him. And it was really profound uh, to me. And he died shortly after. He invited me to his studio in New York, New York, which I never had the opportunity. I didn't get to go, but I planned on it. But I just didn't go soon enough. But when I spent time with Arnold, and um, he, I gave him a copy of my book, Souls Beneath and Beyond Autism, which I did with Sharon Rosenblum, and Arnold wept when he looked at my images. So I spent my life looking at Arnold's work. And then when he looked at my book, he wept, and that, that was amazing. Yeah, here's a pretty profound moment for you. Yeah. To end your career. That's amazing. <laughs> Not a lot of people have an opportunity to meet with one of their legends. Yeah. Reflect on that. Yeah, career. it was really great. And I'm so glad you had the opportunity to do that. Um, so, how do you know, Thomas, when you have captured that moment? That's something that seems almost mystical to those of us who don't work in your realm or in your sphere. 
Um, how do I know when I've captured you know? the moment? How do you know? Uh, it's it happens in here because really my work all originates and comes from within my heart and um, it's making a connection. I've tried really hard through my career to uh, coin the term um, interpretive portraiture and to me interpretive portraiture is more than just a mere physical record it's about capturing the essence of people and um, it's about uh, me gaining my subjects trust and helping them to relax and let their guard down so that I'm able to then capture who they really are and so yes when we're doing portraiture we need to have a pose but uh, my goal is to like not be posing and even though we are posing but not putting the emphasis on the pose and rather uh, putting the emphasis on just being in the moment together and while we're talking and getting to know each other and connecting, making a connection, they trust me enough to just let their guard down and just be in the moment for a couple seconds and that's when I then can capture them. And so it's more than technical to do great portraiture, it's, it's really about connecting with your subject, getting their trust enough so that they will just be in a moment with you and that's when the magic happens. Souls Beneath and Beyond Autism project, how you became involved with that and um, sort of the trajectory of your involvement and what it's opened, the other doors that it's opened up for you. To make a long story short, um, how did I get involved in Souls and doing the Souls book on autism? And Well, I had been, you know, working for, you know, many years on, you know, developing my portrait clientele and um, it was very fulfilling and I felt a lot of gratitude in my heart that I needed to start giving back and I did a project with dancers in the area which was an amazing project with Ellen Worksman, a choreographer and we did a concert and had a lot of big parties and a gallery show that traveled around and I got a lot of accolades from that project. The big opening and the auditorium was packed and uh, you know every Everyone thought I was such a great photographer. I had so many, you know, people that had, you know, just dumping accolades on me, but I couldn't sleep that night because I realized that, you know, what did I really do that made a really big difference? And I, and I had an epiphany at that point. I had an epiphany that I needed to start using my work to do some good things. So I believe we're all given gifts, passions, and talents in our lives, and we need to find them and then use them for good and so I was seeing what an impact that my work was having and I decided that I wanted to do a project that would make a positive impact on a group of people with a common issue and that's what initially came to me and so um, magically you know I made a list I wrote down my goals and everything that I needed showed up and uh, Sharon Rosenblum commissioned me to do a portrait of her son Joey and daughter Rhea and Joey was autistic and Sharon had uh, spent a lot of time helping me to understand autism and um, I knew that she had the message for the book because I was waiting for her to show up and she showed up and um, my life and she didn't even um, no, she was a writer, you know, although she thought someday that maybe, you know, she would write a book, but uh, I knew in my heart that she had the message, and so uh, I presented her the idea, and, and then we were on our way, and it was really magical because through that process, everything we needed showed up, in, including uh, McGraw-Hill to publish it, who we didn't even go out to seek a publisher yet, and uh, Craig Bytine, who was the vice president of McGraw-Hill at the time, um, approached us and uh, offered to publish the book. And uh, then through that book, and when it came out, um, the Autism Society of America gave us the Literary Work of the Year Award. And they flew us out to Pittsburgh and gave us this award at their national convention, which was a thousand people. And so we got to, you know, speak to a thousand people, and they showed our short video, 
um, on um, a message the book has in five minutes and there was a thousand people reaching for a Kleenex it was the most amazing experience of my life um, watching how my work was affecting this huge group of people the energy in that room which just amazed me which is why I knew at that right at that moment while I was sitting in the chair and I was at our the film was on big screens I think there was three of them and because it was such a big audience and I was looking at all the people reaching for Kleenex the whole time and it was just it was just amazing and uh, I knew film was in my future at that point. Did so. you sleep well that night? That well, uh, that night I slept well, yes. And I also, you know, and that, I mean, everything else just kept showing up. It wasn't done once the book came out, and many lives were touched, and we get all these positive responses, and we traveled quite a bit, Sharon and I, around the country due to the book, which was a, a, bl it was a blast, and it was amazing. But then through that book, um, doors just kept opening for me to use my work, my gifts, in an in even bigger way. Uh, and when I got a phone call from Toys R Us, and uh, that was really, uh, really cool. I ended up working on the Faces of Autism campaign, which was four years long. My work was in every Toys R Us uh, for February and March, four years in a row. And I ended up going shooting at Toys R Us, autistic kids. And um, we raised $6.5 million for Autism Speaks, which was something that I'm very proud of. It's exceptional. Yeah, and then uh, Toys R Us was so proud of the project that they invited me to their headquarters at Jeffrey Lane and they had a gallery show in their headquarters with my work and they had a meet and greet where it was just me and all the Toys R Us employees and I shook hands with many employees and it was just an amazing day for me that was really neat. And then another door was kept opening and when uh, I got a call from Miriam Falco from CNN and she had gotten a copy of Souls and uh, Dr. Gupta was a fan of the work and the book. And then uh, my work was used on CNN many years on Autism Awareness Month, which was um, really incredible. And they even interviewed me on their website um, and that was just really, you know, that was really cool. And then um, Health and Human Services got a copy of the book, and the next thing you know, um, the government's using my work in every single government building for some of the campaigns they did, like for people with disabilities, that they are people too, and they have rights. And so that was neat to work with the government, as well as my work's just been for special needs. I probably have one of the biggest collections of special needs um, anywhere that you could find um, and, and then I got into Down Syndrome working with Gigi's Playhouse and we did a traveling gallery show entitled um, I Have a Voice and that's traveled around the country that was an amazing project and then we had uh, done the Million Voices project which is another gallery show that's traveling around the country and uh, they had done one for each Cheesy's Playhouse. Mine was the first one and uh, set the tone for the standard of the rest of them. So it's been pretty cool. Yeah. What a journey. Can you tell me if working with individuals with special needs has expanded your view of your craft or how, oh, how it has yes. changed your craft? In any way? I've learned so much from special needs people and they may communicate in a different way than we do. We may have to spend a little time listening and a little bit of time um, understanding, giving them an opportunity to communicate because it might take them a little bit longer. The autistic kids are trapped in bodies that don't work well when it comes to communication. But when they learn the keyboard, the things that they say are so eloquent and wise, the wisdom that comes out of those kids, it's, it's just amazing. So you taught you about a new window into souls. Right, yes. <laughs> So can you talk a little bit about how this, um, how your philanthropic work has um, shifted your plans for the future a bit and opened up new avenues to you through your production company that you're developing? Um, yeah, um, through my um, journey um, 
and I, I knew back in 1999 when our Souls video was shown at the Autism Society of America Connection that film was going to be my future. And it took me a while, but I realized then if my goal was to touch people's lives and to be able to leave lasting impressions on people's hearts, then film was going to be the way I've been doing stills for, you know, many, many years at that point. And film was a vehicle that was coming and that was uh, going to be a vehicle that I was going to be able to tap into and um, have a large audience. And, and so I'm still, um, you know, I'm working on getting uh, World Touch Productions, which is my production company. That's really exciting to me going forward. I mean, I plan on, you know, continuing with my portrait clientele, which who I love and um, will be there for them. But, but film is going to be a, a big part of my future, creating projects that resonate with people and help to bring messages about, you know, to out to the public. And has working in this new medium taught you any lessons thus far? Any new lessons? I know your, your craft is always evolving. <laughs> yeah, what have I learned from film? Um, it's interesting because um, I've been doing portraiture for so long and I developed my style when I was young and I never really changed my style because what it was is I, I figured out the, the way that I think is the best way to do portraiture and I've been doing it. And it's always new and exciting and never gets boring because they're always working with different exciting people. But uh, with film, it's the same process that's taking place right now. And it's me finding, it's like when I was looking at all those images in those books for all those years, now I am looking in, you know, through the lens and in a different way because now I'm capturing motion and audio, which is really exciting. And so I'm developing my film style it's it's amazing how much great film is out there. There's a lot of young people that are just really technically amazing and they can do a, just some, a lot of great things. I think the direction I'm going is to try to do it from the heart and have heartfelt pieces that leave you with something at the end that leave a, a mark on your heart and, and, and keeps coming back. Absolutely. Well, it's been so nice to sit and reflect with you on your 35-year career, and I'm excited to see where it continues to take you. Thank you so much, Renee. It's been, it's been great.